As It Was by Tuesday Love Sang Rampa Read for you by Blue Friend in beautiful B.C. Book 4 As It Is Now Chapter 10 Sunlight glanced off the placid river sailing so majestically by sweeping along down to the sea like the akashic record sweeping along down to the sea of universal knowledge but here this river was engaging my attention i looked through half-closed eyes at all the little sparklets at the dappled surface as occasionally a leaf went floating by. There was a sudden rustle and flutter, and three water-birds alighted with great splashing on the surface of the water. For some moments they splashed around, throwing water over themselves, digging beneath their wings, and generally having a good avian time. Then, as if at a sudden signal, they spread their wings, paddled their feet, and took off in formation, leaving three increasing circles of ripples behind them. Sunlight, through the leaves of the trees, put contrasting spots of light and shadow on the water's edge before me. The sun was warm. I lay back and became aware of a buzzing noise. Slowly I opened my eyes, and there, right in front of my nose, was a bee looking at me with great interest. Then, as if deciding that I would not be a suitable source of nectar, or whatever it is that bees seek, it buzzed the louder and veered off to some flower sheltering in the shade of a tree. I could hear it droning away there as it busily probed into the flower, and then it came out backwards, and I saw that its legs and body were covered in yellow pollen. It was pleasant here, reclining beneath the trees by the side of the river Thames at Thames Ditton, facing the great palace of Hampton Court. My attention wandered, and I suppose I dozed. Whatever it was, I suddenly became aware of a noise in the distance. I had visions of the royal barge coming down from the Tower of London and carrying Queen Elizabeth I with her then favorite boyfriend and the retinue of servants which seemed inevitable in royal circles. There was music aboard the royal barge, and it seemed incongruous to me to have such music when coming up the Thames, but I could hear the splashing of oars and the creaking of rowlocks. There was much giggling, and I thought to myself in my half-sleep state that surely people in early Elizabethan days did not behave as modern teenagers do. I opened my eyes, and there, just coming round the bend, was a large punt filled with teenagers, and with a gramophone aboard as well as a radio. Both were blaring out different tunes. They rode along, chattering away. Everyone seemed to be talking on a different subject. No one was taking any notice of anyone else. They went along, past Hampton Court, and disappeared from my sight, and for a time all was peace. I thought again of the great Queen Elizabeth, and of her journeys from the Tower of London to Hampton Court. Nearly opposite to where I lay on the bank was the site where they used to have a landing jetty. The rowers used to come close, and then ropes would be thrown, and the barge pulled in gently, so as not to upset the queen's balance, because she was not a very good sailor, not even on the Thames. Hampton Court itself 
was a place that I found fascinating. I visited it often, and even under some unusual conditions, and I could see clearly that the place was indeed haunted with the spirits of those whose bodies had so long ago departed. But there was much talk going on behind me, and I turned around and saw four people there. Oh, my goodness, said a woman. You were so still. You haven't moved for the last ten minutes. We thought you were dead. With that, they moved on, talking and talking and talking. The world, I thought, had too much noise. Everyone had too much talk and too little to say. With that thought in mind, I glanced about me. There were a few boats on the River Thames in front of me. Just down to the left of me was an old man who looked as if he might have been Father Time himself. He was stuck there like an old tree trunk. He had a pipe in his mouth and a faint haze of smoke was coming from it. Tied to a stick in front of him, he had a fishing rod, the float of which was red and white, bobbed about just in front of me. I watched him for a time. He didn't move either, and I wondered what people really saw in fishing. I came to the conclusion that it was just an excuse on the part of some elderly people so that they could keep still and meditate, think of the past and wonder what the future held for them. The future I looked at my watch in alarm, and then hurried to get to my feet and mount the old bicycle which had been lying beside me on the bank. With more haste than usual, I pedaled off down the road and round to the right, and, and so on, the way to West Molesley, where the unemployment exchange was. But no, there was no employment for me no offer of a job. It seemed there were too many people and too few jobs. And as one man told me so bluntly, well, mate, you left your job and you didn't have to. So as you left it and you didn't have to, you don't get paid nothing. See? So it stands to reason that the government ain't going to pay a fellow what left his job, because he had a job before he left it, so you don't get no dole. And as long as you don't get no dole, this here exchange won't get you no job. The exchange keeps its jobs for those who've got dole, because if they get the fellow a job, they don't have to pay him dole, and so their statistics look better. I tried commercial employment agencies, those places where you go and pay money and where, in theory, they find you a job. My own experience may have been particularly unfortunate, but in spite of trying quite a number of them, not one ever offered me a job. I managed to get just odd things to do around Thames Ditton and the district. I was able to do certain medical work which the orthodox physician could not or would not do, and I thought, well, I'm a fully qualified medical man, and I've got the papers to prove it, so why don't I try to get registered in England? Some time later, I approached the General Medical Council unofficially. Actually, I went to their place and told them all about it. They told me that, yes, I had all the qualifications, but, unfortunately, Chungking was now in the hands of the communists, and, they said, I just could not expect my qualifications to be recognized as they were obtained in a communist country. I produced my papers and shoved it straight under the secretary's nose. I said, look... When these papers were prepared, China was not a communist country. It was an ally of England, France, the USA, many other countries. 
I fought for peace just the same as the people in England fought for peace. And just because I was in a different country does not mean to say that I haven't got feelings the same as you have. He hummed and hawed and grunted around, and then he said, Well, uh, come back in a month's time. We'll see what can be arranged. Yes, yes, I quite agree. Your qualifications are such that they should be recognized. The only thing impeding such recognition is that Chungking is now a city in a communist country. So I left his office and went to the Hunterian Museum to look at all the specimens and bottles, and I thought then how amazing it was that humans everywhere were humans everywhere. They all functioned in roughly the same way, and yet if a person was trained in one country, he's not considered qualified to treat people in a different country. It was all beyond me. But jobs were difficult indeed to obtain, and the cost of living at Thames Ditton was quite excessive. I found that as a married man, who in theory I was, expenses were far, far more than when I had to manage alone. At this stage of the book, Perhaps I might take a moment to answer some of those people who write to me horribly, offensively, asking why should I, a Lama of Tibet, live with a woman or have a wife? Well, all you ladies who write so offensively, let me tell you this. I am still a monk. I still live as a monk, and possibly some of you ladies have indeed heard of celibate bachelors who have a landlady or a sister with them with whom they live without necessarily thinking of that. So ladies, the answer is no, I don't. But the time had come to leave Thames Ditton, and we moved nearer into London, because by my own efforts I had made a job available for myself. I came to the conclusion that, as the body that I now occupied was living overtime, there were no opportunities for it. The former occupant of the body, I saw by the Akashic record, really and truly had been going to commit suicide, and that would have completed all the opportunities which his vehicle, his body, would have had. Thus, no matter how hard I tried, I could never take a job which another person could do. The only employment that I could take would be that which I generated for myself. Now, I don't propose to say what employment that was, nor where I did it, because it is nothing to do with this story, but it proved to be adequate to supply our immediate wants and to keep us going. But I must tell you one thing, which irritated me immensely. Again, it was connected with my old enemies, the police. I was driving through South Kensington with an anatomical figure in the back of the car. It was one of those figures which appear in dress shop or which are sometimes provided for the training of surgical fitters. This figure was in the back of the car, and when I started out it had been covered up with cloth, but I drove with the window open, and I suppose the draft had blown part of the cloth off the figure. I was driving along quite peacefully, thinking of what I was going to do next, when suddenly there was a loud blare beside me, which nearly made me jump through the roof. I looked in the mirror, and I found two figures gesticulating at me, pointing me to pull over to the side of the road. There were a lot of cars parked at the side of the road, so I drove in a little to try to find a place where I could stop. The next thing was this police car, for such it was, 
tried to ram me, thinking, they said, that I was attempting to escape at fifteen miles an hour in traffic. Well, I stopped just where I was, holding up the traffic, and I couldn't care less about how cross the people in the other cars were. I just stopped there. The police motioned for me to get out and come to them, but I thought, no, they want to see me, I don't want to see them, so I just sat. Eventually, one policeman got out with his truncheon already in his hand. He looked as if he was going to face a firing squad or something. He really did look frightened. Slowly he came up to my side of the car, walking more or less sideways, presumably to make less of a target in case I started shooting. Then he looked into the back of the car and turned a bright red. Well, officer, what is it? What am I supposed to have done? I asked him. The policeman looked at me, and he really did look silly. He looked absolutely sheepish. I'm sorry, sir, he said, but we were told that a man was driving around and a naked woman's legs were showing through the back window. I reached in to the back and pulled the cloth right off the figure, and then I said, Well, officer, show me any sign of life in this model. Show me how she's been killed. Take a good look at her. And then I covered the figure more carefully. The policeman went back to his car, and all the cars behind us were hooting away as if they were trying to fill a concert hall or something. Feeling thoroughly bad-tempered, I drove off. There was another occasion with the police which may raise a smile. I had an office in London, and it was very near an underground tube station. My wife often used to come and visit me around lunchtime, and when she was leaving, I used to look out of the window just to see that she safely crossed that busy London street. One day, I was just getting ready to finish up and go home when there was a loud official knock at the door. I got up and went to the door, and there were two very large policemen. One said, We want to know what you're doing here. I turned and let them come into my office. He looked about with interest, and his associate got ready to act as a witness. Everywhere the chief policeman looked, his associate looked also. I invited them to be seated, but no, they would not be seated. They were there on official business, they told me. They said they thought I was engaged in some illicit activity and that I was giving signals to some gang. This really shocked me. In fact, I was almost stunned with amazement, and I just could not understand what it is they were talking about. Whatever do you mean? I exclaimed. The chief policeman said, Well, it has been reported to us that you make strange signals at about midday, and we've kept watch, and we've seen you making those strange signals. To whom are you signaling? And then it dawned on me, and I started to laugh. I said, Oh, good God! Whatever is the world coming to? I'm merely waving to my wife when I watch to see that she crosses the road safely and enters the tube station. He said, in reply, That can't be so. You can't see the station from here. Without another word, I got up from my chair, opened the window, which was just to my right, and I said, Look! and see for yourself. 
They looked at each other, and then together they went to the window and looked out, and sure enough, just as I said, there was the underground station opposite. They both changed color a bit, and I said, to make them change color a bit more, Oh, yes, I have seen you two fellows. You were in that block of flats opposite. I saw you trying to hide behind the curtains. I wondered what you were up to. The chief policeman then said, You occupy the floor beneath this office. We have information that you are engaged in sexual activities in that flat below. I had had enough of this, and I said, All right, come downstairs with me and see all the naked females for yourself. They were not at all happy with my attitude, and they wondered what they had done wrong. Together we went down a flight of stairs, and I unlocked a big showroom the windows of which were heavily curtained with expensive lace net. Above the curtained windows there were small ventilators, about a foot square, which, of course, were not curtained. I went to one lay figure and picked it up and said, Look, if a person is carrying this around, putting it from here to here, I demonstrated, a prying nosy parker of an old woman who lives in that flat opposite might think it's a nude body. I rapped on the figures and said, All right, take a look at them. Do they look obscene to you? The policeman changed their tune completely, and the senior one said, Oh, well, I'm sorry you've been troubled, sir. I really am most sorry, but we received a complaint from the sister of a very senior police officer saying that strange things are happening here. We're quite satisfied with what we've seen. You will not be troubled again. Well, I was. I had to go to my office one evening at about seven o'clock, and I unlocked the doors and went in, as I had a perfect right to do. I did the bit of work that I had to do and then left, and as I locked the door behind me, two policemen seized me quite roughly and tried to hustle me to a police car. But I knew my rights, and I asked for an immediate explanation. They told me that it had been reported, yes, it was the same woman, that a sinister-looking man, that was me, had been seen to break into the building, so they were waiting for me. They would not believe that I had a right to be there, so I unlocked the office again, and we went in, and I actually had to call the estate agent who had rented me the place, and he identified me by my voice. Once again the police looked silly, and departed without a word. Soon after that I decided there was no point in staying in such an office, where it was obvious that the old biddy opposite had nothing better to do with her time than imagine that she was a policewoman reporting all manner of imaginary criminal offences. So I left that office, and I went elsewhere. Again, I did certain psychological work among people who could get no assistance from orthodox medicine, and I did quite well, I really did. I cured a number of people, but then, one day, there was a man who tried to blackmail me. So I learned that unless one was actually registered, one was too much at the mercy of people who would gladly get all the assistance they could and then try to blackmail one. 
But the blackmailer, well, he didn't get his way, after all. Just at this time, a young lady came into our life, came into our life of her own accord, of her own free will. We regarded her as a daughter, and still do, and she is still with us. But her destiny, she felt, was such that she had to live with us, and that she did. Later, the press was to make much of this, trying to say that it was a case of the eternal triangle. Nothing could have been further from the truth. We were standing on the square instead of in the eternal triangle. At about this time, I was introduced to an author's agent. I thought I was going to get a job with him, reading and commenting upon author's typescripts, but no, he knew a bit of my story, and very, very much against my own will, I allowed myself to be persuaded into writing a book. One cannot be too particular when starvation is just around the corner, you know. And starvation wasn't just around the corner. It was knocking hard on the door. So I wrote a book. And then, certain authors who were jealous of my knowledge of Tibet tried to trace me up. They got all manner of detective agencies, and one agency, indeed, put an advertisement in either the Times or the Telegraph of London, advertising for Lob Sang Rampa. He should write to such and such an address where something very good was waiting for him. I knew this was a catch, and so I told my agent, Mr. Cyrus Brooks. He got his son-in-law to phone and see what it was all about. Yes, it was indeed a catch. An author in Germany was mightily peeved that I had written about Tibet when he thought that was his own private inviolable province, so he tried to have me traced up so that he could decide what action he could take against me. At about this time, people connected with the young lady who was living with us took a dislike, thinking that I had led her astray. I hadn't, and they also had a private detective trying to find out about me. But this poor fellow, well, it seems to me that he wasn't very bright. He never even tried to get in contact with me. I wonder if he was afraid of me or something. But instead of asking me outright as a man, he relied on hearsay evidence, and as anyone should know, hearsay evidence is not legal evidence, is it? But the two sides came together, and they went to some press reporter who wasn't very popular with his fellows. They tried a few traps, which I saw through. But when, later, we had moved to Ireland, these people made a great campaign against me in the press, saying that I was doing black magic rites in the bottom of the house, that I had a secret temple, that I was guilty of all manner of sex orgies, etc., etc., and that, at some time in my career, I had been in trouble with the police. Well, that was easy. I had always been in trouble with police, but had never been charged with anything, and I had never truly done anything worth police attention. But there's no point in stirring up all troubles and raking up ashes which should be burned out. But I want here to pay testimony to the husband of the young lady. He was and he is a gentleman. He's a very good man, and he's still our friend. And as he well knew, 
and indeed as he testified, the statements about me were quite, quite wrong. No, I am saying no more about this, nothing about the press, nothing about the relatives of the young lady. She still is with us, still with us as a loved daughter. So there you are, that's all there is to that. When all this happened, we had moved to Ireland, and one thing and another had conspired to ruin my health. I had coronary thrombosis, and it was thought that I was going to die, but the press made life so hideous that we had to leave Ireland, which we did with extreme reluctance. I had many friends there, and I still have those self-same friends. We left Ireland and went to Canada, where we are now. We moved about Canada quite a lot. We went to different cities, went to different provinces. But at last we had a letter in the mail which offered a lot. In the mail one day there came a thick letter. The stamps were from a country of which I knew, at that time, remarkably little. It was from Uruguay, the country in South America which rests between Argentina and Brazil. The letter was interesting. It told me that the writer was the head of a big company where they did printing, book publishing, everything. I was asked to go to Montevideo at the expense of that company, and I could continue my work there. I would be provided with secretaries, typists, translation services, in fact everything that I wanted. The writer sent me a photograph of himself looking quite impressive behind a big desk with an IBM typewriter in front of him, a lot of books behind him, and, I think, a Phillips dictating machine there as well. We discussed it, we being my wife and our adopted daughter, and after quite a time we thought that it would be a good idea. So we made all the necessary inquiries, and at long last, because formalities took a time, we got on the train at Fort Erie, Ontario, Canada, for the trip to New York. We were told that we were going to be passengers aboard a Moore McCormack freighter, one which normally took twelve passengers. In New York, everything as usual was bustle and commotion. We stayed the night at one of the big hotels, and the next morning we set off for the Moore McCormick Dock in New York Harbor, and I was highly amused when I found that that dock was one right opposite the one I had made my swim so many years ago, it seemed. However, I said nothing, because there's no point in raking up bitter memories, but I confess I kept quite a lookout for river police. We went aboard the ship and found our staterooms, and so, late that night, with four locomotives loaded aboard on the deck, we steamed away to first Vitoria in Brazil. There we went up a long inlet before we arrived at a very picturesque, very hot little community. That was our first port of call. Then we went down to a place nearby so that the locomotives, they were diesel locomotives, for the Brazilian railroads could be unloaded. There were two or three more stops in Brazil until we were cleared for Montevideo in Uruguay. But as we approached Montevideo, actually we were at Punta del Este, the captain was informed by radio that we could not land in Montevideo because there was a dock strike on. So we went to Buenos Aires first, and we stayed in that port for about a week. 
It was quite a busy port, and we saw an enormous number of foreign ships come in. German ones seemed to be the most popular ones, and quite a lot of ships, it seemed, were going straight up the river, which forms the frontier between Argentina and Uruguay. We were told that a few miles further up there was a great meat-packing plant, the plant of Frey Bentos. At last, though, we were cleared to leave port, and down we went along the Rio de Plata, and at long last we came to Montevideo, our destination. We got into the outer harbour, and the ship had to drop anchor. There had been a strike, and a whole fleet of ships was assembled, and they had to be attended to first, because they were there first. So we stayed aboard ship for about a week. At last the ship was allowed to enter harbour, and we went ashore. Our hopes were completely dashed, however, because we found that the man with an immense business did not have such an immense business after all. Instead, well, to put it kindest, he was a man with ideas, which did not always work out. It was very expensive living in Montevideo. They seemed to have a peculiar idea there that everything had to be paid for in American dollars. So, in effect, taking into consideration the rate of exchange, we were paying fantastic sums for even the basic items. However, we stayed there for about a year and a half, then we found there were all manner of strikes and increasing restrictions on foreigners, so we decided to leave. It is most unfortunate that we had to leave because Montevideo was a nice place indeed. The people, for the most part, except for the strikers, were very pleasant, very courteous, and it was like being in a European city. It was a beautiful city, with a wonderful harbour and beaches. For a very short time we stayed at a place called Carrasco, quite near the airport. This had one terrible defect, in that very fine sand from the immense beaches was always getting blown into the houses. So, as we were also too far from the city centre, we moved to an apartment building which overlooked the lighthouse. A few miles out, in the approaches to the harbour, there was a wrecked ship. It had been quite a large passenger liner, and for some reason the ship had been sunk just off the main entrance, and there it remained. At low tide one could just see the main deck. At high tide the bridge and the bridge deck was still above the water. We saw quite a lot of smuggling going on here, because the ship was used as a drop for smugglers. There were many beautiful sights in Montevideo, including a high eminence just across the other side of the harbour. This was known as the Mountain, and there was a sort of fort, which was a local tourist attraction, right at its peak. The British had done much to modernize Montevideo. They had started its bus service, and they had also started the gasworks, and one of the advantages of that was that so many people had a smattering of English. One day, when we had moved to yet another apartment closer into the city centre, the sky turned black, and for a time everything turned bitterly cold. And then there came a cyclone. Three of us struggled to close our open window, and as we were there, congregated, pushing our shoulders hard against the window, we saw an amazing sight indeed. 
the bus station roof just below us suddenly vanished. All the sheets of corrugated iron were flying through the air as if they were made of tissue paper. We looked down and saw all the buses there and the workers were gazing up, wide-mouthed and wide-eyed. A really amusing sight for us was when hens, which had been kept on the flat roofs of houses in Montevideo, were blown straight up in the air and crossed street after street in probably the only flight they'd ever had in their lives. It really is an astonishing sight to see hens go flying by with their wings tight to their sides. A sight which really amused me was when a whole clothesline laden with newly washed clothes went sailing by. The line was as tight and as stiff as an iron bar and sheets and unmentionables were hanging straight down as if in still air. I have seen many cyclones, whirlwinds, etc., etc., but this, from my point of view, was quite the most amusing. But Montevideo was losing its charm, so we decided to return to Canada because of the various groups of communists who were making trouble. In many ways I'm sorry for it, because I think I would rather live in Uruguay than in most other places. They have a different mentality there. They call themselves the Oriental Republic of Uruguay. It is a poor country with wonderful ideals, but ideals so idealistic that they were impractical. We returned to Canada by sea, and then there was a question of making money, so I had to write another book. My health was deteriorating a lot, and that was the only thing I could do. During my absence, I found that a person had written a book on material I had written for an English magazine some years previously. He was a very peculiar sort of person. Whenever he was tackled or threatened by a law case, he conveniently went bankrupt, and friends or relatives bought his business so there was not much redress. In fact, there was none. One of the big troubles I have had since writing The Third Eye is the number of people who write approved by Love Sang Rampa and just put labels to that effect on the goods they supply. All that is quite intense. I do not approve things. Many people, too, have impersonated me. In fact, on quite a number of occasions I've had to call in the police. There was, for example, a man in Miami who wrote to a bookseller in San Francisco in my name. He actually signed my name. He wrote a lot of Holy Joe stuff, which I never do and he ordered a lot of books to be sent to him. Quite by chance, I wrote to the bookseller at the same time from Vancouver, and he was so amazed at getting a letter, apparently from me and in British Columbia, that he wrote to me and asked how I was moving so quickly. So it came out that this fellow had been for some time ordering goods in my name and not paying. As I said, if anyone is fool enough to take as me the gobbledygook that this fellow had been writing deserves to get caught. There have been others, such as the man who retired to a mountain cave, sat cross-legged with darn little clothing on him, and pretended to be me. He advised teenagers to have sex and drugs, saying that it was good for them. But the press, 
of course, seized on such incidents and made quite a commotion, and even when it was proved that these impostors were impersonating me, the press never got around to reporting the actuality of what happened. I am utterly, utterly, utterly opposed to suicide. I am utterly, utterly, utterly opposed to drugs, and I am utterly, utterly opposed to the press. I think that the average pressman is not fitted to report things on metaphysics or the occult. They do not have the knowledge. They do not have the spirituality, and in my opinion, they just do not have the brain power. After a time, in Fort Erie, to which we returned from South America, we went to Prescott, Ontario, where we lived in a small hotel. The manager of that hotel was an extremely fine man, indeed. We stayed there a year, and during the whole of that year there was never, at any time, the slightest disagreement or slightest lack of harmony between management and us. His name was Ivan Miller, and he was a real gentleman, and I wish I knew his address now to again express my appreciation of all the efforts that he made. He was a great big man, huge in fact, and he had been a wrestler, yet he could be more gentle than most women. End of chapter 10